Just 30 years ago, nobody could have told you what this object was, let alone the kind of wonders you could work with it. Well, times change. And today, it's hard to imagine a single modern home or office without at least one of these revolutionary devices. It takes about 90 minutes to assemble a computer. Its hard disk drive saves information transmitted to it for a long time. The reading head reads the information. It is extremely precise. The space between the reading head and the hard disk is as thin as a hair. The hard disk is installed in its position within the computer. There are two other units which safeguard information, the removable three-inch disk reader and the CD-ROM reader, which allows for the reading and execution of programs recorded on compact disks. These two units are placed into position. The spinal column of the computer is the motherboard. It is to this unit that the other elements of the computer are connected. This cooler dissipates the heat generated by the chipset. Certain sound cards are integrated directly on the motherboard. These connections in sequence are the audio input, its output, and the microphone port. This AGP retaining ring secures the video card during transport. This thermal unit measures the temperature emitted between the processor and the motherboard. The processor is the brain of the system. It interprets, calculates, and executes the instructions given to it. The processor has several million transistors, and its cadence, its operating speed, reaches the gigahertz level. The processor rests on this base. The processor's cooler dissipates the intense heat. Its efficiency depends on the type of material used, and a conducting material assures better cooling. The RAM memory stores short-term information, but erases it when the current is turned off. This memory is more rapid than that of the hard disk or CD-ROM. Now they integrate everything in the case. It protects the internal elements from the external elements. At this stage, they install the electronic components in the case. Several connectors of the case are connected to the motherboard, such as the computator and various light indicators. This is the output connection for the video card, which links the computer to the monitor. We also see the video chip, which creates images in two and three dimensions. Here is the video memory. The more its capacity is increased, the clearer will be the image displayed on the monitor. The video card is placed into its position. The modem allows two computers to communicate. Its capacitors produce the perfectly clean phone signal to facilitate communications. These modem chip connectors control information circulating between the two computers. The fax modem is installed. The power supply transforms electricity according to the voltage required by the different components. The computer's internal cabling is installed. It allows information to travel between the different media and the motherboard. The IDE cable is connected and the CD-ROM. The last electrical wires are connected to different computer components. The assembly of 30 components of the computer is now finished. Just before closing the case, they test each computer to verify the correct functioning of the peripherals. Then they close up and proceed to packaging. This company produces about 300 computer units every day. Computer technology changes quicker than just about any other industry on Earth. So watch fast. 
electronic circuits have shrunk from miles of wiring to the size of a computer circuit board. And they're still getting smaller. An electronic circuit board is a computer component that can produce spectacularly realistic scenes. Animating this particular three-dimensional graphic took four months of work by artists and programmers with the aid of a G400 graphic processor by Matrox. A printed circuit board can be compared to a building composed of fiberglass floors, copper passageways, and stairs that link the floors between them. Cards are assembled with two technologies, surface wiring and wiring through the card. The components are placed into the holes and soldered in place. A stencil is used to apply soldering paste onto the card. This paste will solder the surface components. Here, they place the stencil into the printing unit. It is through these holes that the soldering paste will run. The machine spreads the soldering paste, which contains, among other elements, a tin lead alloy. The printing blades go into action. They spread the soldering paste on the stencil. This paste runs through the stencil holes and covers the metallic surfaces of the printed circuit board, which will establish the electric current. Here is the difference between an unprinted card and another printed one. The unprinted card surface is much more shiny. Now they're going to install the surface wiring elements. They are automatically positioned by this rapid placement machine. About 36,000 components are installed per hour. That's about 10 per second. This incredibly sophisticated machine is equipped with a viewing camera that verifies the alignment and dimensions of each part before installation, and it unerringly positions the part at the exact spot. Another machine, slightly less precise than the previous one, installs parts where the space between two placement points is less than two one-hundredths of an inch. It can install 8,000 parts in 60 minutes. The card continues on its way toward the oven, which accomplishes an essential operation. Once the parts are secured, the card goes into a convection oven, where the heat will solder the parts to the card. Different circuit connectors through the card are inserted into their respective holes. This operation requires great dexterity and is entirely done by hand. The metallic placement points need to be soldered to the card. The soldering of the circuit components through the card is done with a bath of molten tin lead alloy at a temperature of 465 degrees. Now everything is installed. They have to do an initial electrical test. The card is placed on a bed of electrified pegs. These pegs make contact with the card's connecting points, allowing them to check for short circuits or open circuits in the card. And then a final test, a computer-aided operating test to see if the card is functioning perfectly. This company fabricates 200 different circuit board models and produces about 4,000 cards each week. The term robot comes from the Czech word robota, which means forced labor. Most robots are designed for repetitive work that's difficult, dangerous, or would just bore human beings to death. Robotic arms have varying degrees of freedom, meaning they can pivot in different ways.
A robotic arm resembles a human arm. It has a shoulder, an elbow, a wrist, and a hand. The shoulder is actually a stationary base to which the rest is attached. An engineer first designs all the parts on a computer. Then those plans go into action. To form the base's outer casing, they bend steel sheeting into shape using a computer-guided press. Next, they paint the casing in powder paint using an electrostatic process that guarantees a thorough, even coat. They run a negative electrical charge to the casing and a positive charge to the paint particles. This makes the casing draw the paint to it like a magnet. Once the paint on the base casing dries, they use silkscreen printing to apply what's called the user diagram. It illustrates which parts move where and how. Now they build the robotic arm's hand, called the end effector. Robots can be outfitted with all sorts of end effectors. Here they're making a gripper, whose two claws come together to grasp and carry objects. To make each claw, an automated metal drill cuts a groove lengthwise and widthwise in a piece of aluminum. They assemble the electrical circuit board that will later go inside the base. The robotic arm's six separate motors will plug into it. Next, they assemble the mechanical parts of the base. First, the motor that makes the arm rotate, then the gear that goes on the vertical shaft holding the robotic arm upright. When the motor makes the gear in the shaft turn, the robotic arm turns with it. At the arm's shoulder level, they install a system of four pulleys. Each consists of two plastic wheels on a separate axle with a rubber belt running between them like a clothesline. The belt has little teeth that grip grooves on the wheels. It rotates the wheels, making the robotic arm move. Each joint in the robotic arm is capable of and programmed for a specific range of movement. Like the human arm, the combination of these movements manipulates the end defector. They plug an electrical wire that links the gripper to the shoulder into a circuit board located in the shoulder. Then they screw the entire arm to the base. They link up the wires from the circuit board in the base to the motors in the shoulder. To do this, they have to bunch the wires, 48 of them in total, and thread them through the shaft that attaches the base to the arm. Once everything's connected, they fine-tune and test the gear and pulley systems to see if they run smoothly. Now they can install the gripper and the shaft and gear system that operates it. Turning the gear one way opens the grip. Turning it the other way closes it. Now they mount the assembled gripper to the forearm, plugging its motor into a circuit board that they've already installed there. They plug the wires from all six motors into the main circuit board, which they then install at the back of the base. The robot controller, the brain that runs the arm, is a separate unit. It controls everything connected to the circuit. To move the robot, the computer inside the controller switches on all the necessary motors. It can control eight motors, six in the robot, and two optional accessories. You can program it to perform a variety of tasks. From start to finish, it's taken just under 30 hours to assemble this robotic arm. It can lift up to 10 pounds, about the weight of a full-grown cat, and it can move at a speed of a little over one mile per hour. Most robots are reprogrammable, meaning that to change their behavior, you simply write a new program. From an employer's perspective, robots may be the ideal workers. Granted, they have no ideas of their own, but their productivity is constant. They never call in sick, and they never take lunch or coffee breaks. The latest taxidermy trend is motion. Today, many museums and nature centers feature wildlife models that move. These robotic replicas look so lifelike that hunters use them as decoys, and game wardens set them out to catch poachers in the act. 
Activated by remote control, the robotic decoy's head turns and its tail wags. More elaborate models have additional moving body parts. The decoy can be set up directly on the ground or installed on a track system, which moves it along as though it's walking. At the decoy factory, they begin by waxing a two-part fiberglass body mold. This one's for a deer. Waxing the mold cavity will make it easy to extract the casting. Next, they put steel reinforcement bars in the legs. The bars stick out the bottom of the hoofs as stakes to prop the decoy on the ground. They apply the other half of the mold and clamp all around the perimeter to hold the two parts together. They prepare the mold for the deer's head the same way, then pour in a bit of liquid casting material. They pour about three quarts of it into the body mold and clamp on the head mold. This casting material is expanding polyurethane foam. It begins swelling immediately and within two minutes reaches full expansion, transforming from a liquid to a flexible solid. Over the next hour and a half, the foam cures to a hard, inflexible state, at which point they remove the clamps and extract the casting. Some foam seeped out between the two halves of the molds and between where the head meets the body, producing seams which workers now sand flat. Using a round drill bit, they make one-inch sockets for eyes. Then, with a miniature router bit, they drill out nostrils. They glue a glass eye into each socket with a bit of wet clay. When the clay dries, the eye is set securely in place. No faux fur for these decoys. Workers scrape any remnants of flesh off a real deer hide, then wash the hide and apply a preservative. Then they slip the hide over the foam deer. They fit the fur to the form snugly, using a combination of staples, glue, and stitching. Once the deer is fully dressed, it's put aside for four to six weeks. This gives the preservative ample time to penetrate and do its job, which is to dry and harden the hide. This is essential to ward off insects and prevent the hide from decomposing. The taxidermy phase of production is now complete. Now, off with his head, because it's time to install the robotics, which will make the head move. The first step is to drill out a cavity inside the neck. This creates a pocket in which to install the plastic housing, which contains the robotic components. The first of those components is a compact motor. It drives this hard plastic gear. Next, the receiver for the remote control. Then a AA battery pack that powers both the motor and the receiver. All this goes into the neck pocket. They drill out a cavity in the head and install a gear and shaft. The final step is to mount the head onto the body, inserting the shaft into the gear on top of the motor. So now when the motor runs, it rotates the gear, which turns the shaft, which moves the decoy's head. Each moving body part has the identical mechanics, its receiver corresponding to a dedicated switch on the remote control. The remote works from more than three-tenths of a mile away. You can even program it to put the decoy through a preset motion routine. Music, photographs, documents. What used to take up shelf space in our homes and offices can now be stored on a tiny memory card or flash drive. You can save your files on it, take them out of the device and transport them anywhere, as well as delete data you no longer need.
A memory card fits into a slot in your digital device. A flash drive plugs into a USB port. The key component of both formats, a memory chip, produced in a factory that's 1,000 times cleaner than a hospital operating room. It all begins with the wafer, a thin disk of pure silicon, a non-metallic natural element that conducts electricity. An automated container system moves the wafer through more than 800 operations. At each stop, the wafer receives one of several layers of non-conductive materials such as silicon dioxide and conductive materials such as copper. The machines coat the layer with light-sensitive fluid, then apply UV light through a glass stencil of the complex pattern of electrical circuitry. The exposed areas of fluid chemically react, locking the material directly underneath into the circuitry pattern. Chemical baths then remove the surrounding fluid and material, leaving only the layer of circuitry, electrical pathways 2,000 times narrower than a human hair. A robot tests the circuitry for every memory chip on the wafer. A single wafer, measuring 12 inches in diameter, yields hundreds of memory chips. The goal is to make those chips as small as possible. In this industry, it's all about maximum memory in minimal space. That's why this operation thins the chips by grinding away two-thirds of the silicon from the back side of the wafer. And one last step before cutting the wafer into individual memory chips. This machine applies tape to hold the separated chips together. A computer-guided saw slices the chips apart. Cutting silicon is like cutting glass. It requires a diamond edge blade. In the next step, a robotic arm, following the wafer map generated earlier, picks up the chips which pass testing and attaches each one to a fiberglass lead frame. The term lead refers to the frame's pins, which connect the chip to the digital device. Another robot wires the chip to the lead frame with gold thread that's about the width of a human hair. Gold is very conductive, so now the pathway is complete. Electricity will travel from the chip circuitry through the gold thread to the pins to the device. After a machine seals the chip in plastic, workers gently snap them apart and insert them in memory card housings. The plastic and metal housing is for a memory card format known as compact flash. A small automated press locks the two halves of the housing together. The next station labels the front of the housing. Every single memory card undergoes testing for both function and speed. A laser machine etches product information into the back of the housing. These are another format called Secure Digital or SD. They're assembled and labeled just like the compact flashcards. When the finished memory cards come off the assembly line, workers conduct a final visual inspection. On the flash drive assembly line, much the same process, a robot puts 20 lead frames on 20 circuit boards. Then a worker positions 20 USB connectors, which a soldering machine bonds to the circuit boards. The final step, electronic testing, to make sure the USB connection is working and via the circuit board, talking to the chip. The flash drives are now ready to go into individual housings. This model has a two-part plastic housing, which pivots in and out of a plastic case that can conveniently be attached to a keychain or lanyard for easy portability. Flash drive or memory card. Storing your digital effects is just a click away.